Right, ladies and gentlemen, we have approximately uh, 25 minutes of uh, question time available before the doors spring open. Uh, moving about you now will be a number of uh, junior officers who will have microphones available when I invite you to, uh, to ask your questions. Again, can I reiterate, uh, when you ask a question, if you can keep the question short and if you can address your question to a particular speaker having identified yourself first. Um, I think we've just heard two very interesting presentations that took a very different tack to addressing the, the current situation. One that looked very much at the strategic adequacy of the question that we were seeking to answer through the defence white paper, and another that sought to answer the question in terms of its coherency and its relevance given the many changes uh, in a number of uh, strategic documents. Um, I'll also let you know that uh, during this uh, question time, there'll be a Twitter feed running behind us. Um, so no, it's not an accident from the tech guys. So if it comes up and you start to see some Twitter, um, we'll either take those questions as they come along, uh, if, if they indeed they are questions, or give you a sense of what some other folks are seeking to ask as they go around. Uh, at that point, I'll uh, open the floor to your questions, please. Uh, I can see one at the back waving their hands. Neil James from the Australia Defence Association. Uh, my question is for Peter Jennings. Uh, Peter, isn't there a C missing uh, from your list of Cs, and that's the Chief of Service Committee? Uh, wouldn't steerage of, uh, of a future white paper process be more intellectually disciplined um, if the Chiefs of Staff Committee had the steerage rather than the reasonably incoherent uh, processes we have at the moment? Uh, thanks, Neil. Um, uh, I think that um, it's an unreasonable ask of um, the COSC to play that role of being the group that has to self-administer its own bad medicine um, in terms of uh, what is likely to be at least the starting point of a new white paper process, which is about cutting the strategic cloth to fit the financial outlook. Um, that's why I, I think there is great value in um, uh, an external process which can uh, sort of um, frankly cut through that cut through that uh, institutional impediment to making those really hard decisions um, I mean really that's what we saw both in 2009 and 2013 was a failure to do that now of course I'm not suggesting that defense can't be intimately involved in in the process of uh, uh, making helping uh, government make those judgments but at the end of the day I wouldn't leave it just to the department on this occasion Thank you. Next question. Sir. Uh, uh, James Gaderian. I'm um, from the University of Sydney's Centre for International Security Studies. And it was refreshing to um, actually hear the role of the United States and China downplayed. But um, I'm just curious as to how you feel the similar efforts at uh, formulating strategic plans from the defence policy guidances, the quadrennial defence reviews, have repercussions for the Australian one. And in this case, for Michael, I would ask, you talked about a strategic rivalry. Well, for the quadrennial defense review, the most important strategic rivalry is between the Army, of course, and the Navy and Air Force, boots on the ground versus the other armed services. And whether or not that is more important sometimes than how state rivalries play out in how these documents get written. I mean, it's been a long-running series of competitions between the network-centric warfare people, Navy, Air Force, and the boots-on-the-ground counterinsurgency people. And that seemed to be missing a bit as well from Peter's assessment on um, not just sort of a comparative, you know, um, strategic review, this would be a great dissertation topic, by the way, for a, a student, looking at how different nation states, the process and the outcome ends up creating this view of the world. But really, what's going to be the inter-service rivalry and why you didn't mention enough, I think, how, of course, we had a sea power conference, but why you did not mention this outer countervailing force of the army, of the boots on the ground, counterinsurgency doctrine, as opposed to high-tech futures um, for the strategies of all these countries. Thank you very much. Thanks for that question. It's a very good point. Um, I think uh, many in the audience would not only be aware of the inter-service rivalries uh, in the United States, but uh, the uh, few reports that are starting to come out about uh, 
rivalries within uh, the Chinese Armed Forces and Administration, um, uh, particularly driven uh, driving some of the um, seemingly contradictory uh, positions and statements on disputes such as the South China Sea disputes. So um, it's a very good point, and and I think uh, a, an example of uh, not only the increasing complexity of government, but the increasing complexity of some of these rivalries that you do have different parts of government advocating different things and speaking uh, in different tongues, if you like. Um, it makes it very much uh, more difficult and very much more dynamic and perhaps even dangerous uh, to have uh, a variety of voices within some very large governments. So uh, it's a very good point. Well, I was, I was struck this morning with the r remarkable endorsement from uh, David Morrison for the sort of maritime uh, concept uh, 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 for Australian defence thinking. Um, I rather imagine the uh, all ship, all shore memo has already gone out from Navy office with a copy of uh, the General's uh, speech. Um, the thing is, um, the services don't necessarily engage in deep rivalry when um, economic times are good and, and the resources are there to allow for a sort of a comfortable consensus around how those those resources are going to be distributed. And that's really where we were from um, the early 2000s until um, probably about 2010. Um, now what we see is a significant uh, pressure um, and I think almost a sense that uh, uh, um, uh, Russell feels it could possibly wait out a government as it kind of did to see what a coalition might do in terms of increased expenditure. I think what we'll see though is that the increased expenditure isn't going to happen, at least not quickly. And so therefore we are thrown back to this question of now a much more um, um, hard-edged discussion that has to take place within defence, uh, possibly supported by an external reviewer as I've suggested, uh, as to where those difficult choices have to be made. So the years of comfortable consensus just won't, won't last for any longer. Question, please. Good afternoon, David Palmer. Um, Mr. Jeffries, one of your uh, concerned members in the community. I am worried somewhat by having a detachment, a semi-permanent detachment of Marine infantry in the north. While it's wildly remote, they possess or present a threat in being to us. But does China or Indonesia see this as a threat in being? I'd like your uh, aspect on that. Uh, am I um, having spoken to a, a significant number of um, uh, PLA officials over some years, I, I don't think the Chinese see um, 200 or 1,200 or even 2,500 Marines in Darwin as a, as a dagger pointed at the heart of uh, Beijing. Uh, I think there is a sense that China has that Australia is a, a rusted-on military ally of the United States and that that's not really going to change, notwithstanding the very um, close economic relationship we, we have with China. There I think there is, um, that's pretty much the, the, the beginning and the end of, uh, of the China view. Not to say that diplomatically it, it doesn't get used for effect from time to time, but uh, uh, that, that is how I would characterise the Chinese position. On Indonesia, um, I think that uh, there is perhaps a small group in the country that um, uh, was a little edgy about the initial announcement when uh, President Obama was here in, uh, towards the end of uh, 2011 um, around what for Australians would sound like a very strange preoccupation, which was this, perhaps this was some plot aimed at the um, uh, territorial integrity of Papua. Uh, I mean, nothing, I think, frankly, could be further from uh, the Australian or, or, the, or the American mind. Since that time, I think Indonesia has um, appreciated the very close process of dialogue that the government and the Defence Department engaged in in developing the 2013 White Paper to talk with uh, Jakarta about the policy settings that the document articulated. I, I know that was very well received by the Indonesians. And I think they see the... US uh, presence there. M more these days as an opportunity for bilateral cooperation, Indonesia, US, and possibly trilateral cooperation, Indonesia, US, Australia. 
Um, oh, look, just very briefly, I think uh, I'd endorse what Peter had to say. I think it would be slightly different if Australia was alone in tightening its alliance relationship with the United States, but the fact is that since about 1996, there has been a very strong trend um, of a lot of countries in uh, the Western Pacific region tightening their, de their defence cooperation with the United States, which goes not only to long-standing allies such as Japan and South Korea, uh, but also uh, countries that uh, uh, haven't had formal defence relationships with the United States. I'm talking about uh, you know, the Singapores uh, and the Indias of the world, um, and e even countries that in uh, the relatively recent past have been enemies of the United States like uh, Vietnam. So um, I think uh, the, the picture that probably emerges for Beijing is that there is something fairly uniform going on and um, the, the, the location of a few thousand US Marines in Darwin is very much of a, a long-term historical trend that is involving quite a few countries in this part of the world. Uh, Commander Mark Sirwa, I just have a question for Professor uh, Michael Wesley. Uh, with your view of inter interdependence and rivalry uh, going hand in hand, uh, what is your view, your belief on maritime security, which Lake Chief of Navy says does require a collaborative and cooperative approach to succeed? Is it possible in the Asian region? I think it's possible and, and actually very necessary. Um, this isn't uh, hugely new to hear me say this or, or for anyone to say it, um, but, uh, but the fact is that uh, the growing uh, naval capabilities in, in this part of the world uh, is probably outstripping um, uh, experience and doctrine in terms of uh, uh, particularly incidents at sea. Uh, one of the things that makes uh, some of the territorial disputes in uh, particularly the South China Sea, East China Sea regions uh, dangerous is is the fact that there are uh, so many players involved, uh, that the situation is so unclear and dynamic, um, that, uh, that the various sides believe that no side can uh, allow any other side's claims to go unanswered. Um, add into that mixture nationalism, uh, perhaps adventurism on the, on the behalf of some less experienced uh, personnel on either side, and you've got a very dangerous situation. So um, I, I know that there are a number of different uh, interests uh, and, uh, and perspectives that, that call for the development of uh, agreements to cover incidents at sea. I think that's a very uh, sound idea. I think it's a very important uh, thing to do. Um, this is a period, I think, <coughs> where we are facing um, uh, genuine contestation of the maritime commons. The sort of contestation that really uh, is, is out, of, uh, out of all um, experience for a very long time. And uh, when you have got contestation of the commons, any type of commons, you need emergent rules of the road of how to deal with them. And I think um, in this part of the world, particularly the maritime commons, uh, there needs to be quite a lot of work done on, on building those. General Johnson, uh, Chief of the Kuwait Navy. My question for uh, Professor uh, Wesley. Wesley. Sorry, I cannot see, uh, see, see well. Uh, it's very interesting uh, 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 when, you, when you put some sort of uh, uh, three peninsula and uh, uh, it's some sort of theory, which I like. But I might disappoint, I mean, disagree with you in a point that you did not include Russia in this. Hmm. Uh, it has a location on the uh, part of the uh, uh, Bering Sea. And also, I think Russia is playing uh, a very strong role, although we are not in the Cold War era. But look what's happening these days uh, in the Middle East. So Russia is playing a role. You think you, you're... you're uh, uh, theory will be uh, uh, successful and acceptable if not considering Russia. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, that's a very interesting question, and um, I'll use the question as a, as a chance for a cheap plug of my book that I'm writing at the moment. <laughs> um, because uh, what I presented to the conference was uh, what I believe is the southern tier of strategic rivalry in Asia. There is a northern tier, uh, which I believe the two main protagonists are China and Russia, potentially. Uh, and the key area of contestation, uh, I, I see not as the bays and peninsulas of the southern tier of Asia, but really an archipelago of states going across Central Asia. Uh, so I, I note with great interest your, your view of Russia's role um, in the Middle East in particular, uh, but I wonder whether uh, the real strategic concern of Russia is uh, the stability of Central Asia, the growing role of China in Central Asia, and whether that's believed to be a threat to Russia's core interests in that particular part of the world. Um, the interesting thing, again, is that the only country, I think, that is vitally involved in both, in contests both in the southern tier and in the northern tier uh, is China. And I think this will make uh, a very difficult set of um, uh, strategic uh, calculations for Beijing to, to work out. But I thank you for your question and I'll, I'll certainly look further into it. I might just uh, abuse the microphone for a second if I can and, and ask Professor Wesley this question, which is that given the rivalrous independence picture that you've painted for us, has our defence security policy made an adequate response? Well, that's a tough question, Stuart. Um, and I, I'd, the easy way would be to defer to Peter Jennings, who knows <laughs> a, a lot more about it than I do. Um, look, I can't, I can't really see an adequate response in the papers that I read. Um, I think uh, the Australian way of looking at the world tends to look much more at relationships than complexes of issues and um, particular uh, trends that are developing in a, in a particular area. Uh, when I read the three documents that Peter talked about, I see a great deal of attention being paid to the management of particular relationships. Uh, to me, uh, those relationships are going to be important. If we are going into a situation of strategic interdependence, I think we need to be alive to the fact uh, that we are being watched very closely. Some of our smaller decisions are being watched very closely by Washington, Beijing, New Delhi, Jakarta and others. Um, and uh, to an extent often overinterpreted as to why we do things. Um, uh, on the other hand, I think we need to, A, spend a lot more time thinking about some smaller countries in our region, which I think are just as crucial to our strategic future, but also think about the three bays and the three peninsulas and how the various scenarios might play out there and what we would do in relation to them. One of the big questions that's being asked is, and I think rightly so, what is the future of Australia's defence posture and, and diplomatic posture in relation to West Asia? following the drawdown of our troops in Afghanistan and, and uh, the exit from places like Iraq, I wonder whether the hard thinking has been done, not only at the defence level, but at the foreign policy level, about what our enduring interests in the Gulf region might be post-Afghanistan. Uh, well, I wouldn't disagree with Michael's comments. Um, uh, look, I, mean, I think the defence debate in Australia in the last few years has really centred around issues of funding and um, <clears throat> the strategy has kind of been retrofitted to find an after the fact justification for the level of funding which has been made available in a rather piecemeal sort of process. That's, that's not terribly satisfactory. Um, I, I think also that you know there is a big threshold question um, that really has to be more um, thoroughly addressed uh, the next time round which is just how to, how to characterise the, 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 the kind of strategic set of um, changes and trends and forces that we find ourselves in. We, you know, is it the glass half empty world of the 2009 Defence White Paper where a major maritime capability build up is the necessary response? 
is it the glass half full world of the um, um, Asian century white paper and the national security statement, which basically says that we can hitch Australia's wagon to an always growing um, North Asia in particular. Um, you know, there's clearly a, uh, you could drive a set of um, um, strategic trucks through the differences of perspective which are reflected in those two sort of competing views. And we need to come to terms with that and, and sort of hammer the issue out, I think, in a much more um, detailed and careful way. Thank you. Question at that side. Uh, Graham Orcheston, ENS International. We're a specialist in the area of negotiation, relationship and stakeholders. And one of the things that we know is you need to look below the waterline. Simply to understand what people are saying to you is not enough. <coughs> you need to understand what is actually driving them under the waterline. Now, Professor Wesley, your comment about 200% increase in the uh, growth in defence budgets, your comment about them sometimes over-reading why we make decisions, what do you see as being under the waterline reaction to our future submarine program? What are the unforeseen consequences of that strategically particularly given your three bays and your regional cooperation you talked about? Look, I'm, I'm not a, a defence equipment specialist, but what I can, um, what I can determine from reading uh, the literature on the arms build-up in our particular region is that uh, if we do achieve our submarine build-up, and I understand that uh, there are some real questions about that, but if we do achieve it, it will be part of a general trend in the region of uh, the acquisition of some really very sophisticated weapon systems, uh, not only in the submarine area, but, uh, but in the craft, in the, uh, in the missile space, uh, as well as unmanned systems and so on. So um, I, I would think that uh, it wouldn't be out of, out of step with what's, what's already occurring. I think we have time for one more question. If we're quick, we'll go for a second. Uh, Desmond Woods, Australian Naval Institute. In about 1890, Bismarck was asked whether he thought there'd ever be another great war in Europe. And the old man responded that he thought if there ever was, it'd be over some stupid thing that happened in the Balkans, which was very prescient of him. What about the stupid things that might happen in our region? Uh, if you look in your crystal ball, what are the potential flashpoints that in retrospect we'll say, well, that was predictable and probably preventable if we thought carefully in advance? <laughs> oh dear, gee, thanks for that. <laughs> thanks for that. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people spent a lot of time talking about uh, Indo-Pakistan, -Pa uh, Korean Peninsula, Taiwan Straits, but I actually think that it's really the maritime um, competition in the South China Sea and the East China Sea that is most worrying because it, it brings in, uh, as I said before, a number of players, it brings in nationalism, uh, it brings in a, a new domain, uh, contested commons, um, and uh, and it brings in, I think, in an increasing way, the United States versus China. You know, in the background, the United States isn't backing any of the claims. What it is backing uh, is freedom of navigation. And what is emerging is very divergent views uh, between Beijing and Washington as to what freedom of navigation actually means. So I think those are the things that I look around and, and that worry me at the moment. Uh, well, I, I, there's a, a five-test series against England uh, coming up this summer, and uh, I'm pretty worried about that. I think, uh, <laughs> you know, n no one will say they didn't see that coming. Uh, 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 um, but let me also offer, um, I, I don't think I've seen uh, relations between China and Japan as, as, as bad as they are for a generation, and that does worry me. Not that I think this would lead to um, a major conventional conflict between the two countries. I don't think that's on the cards, but I, I do think we could see almost uh, an incident and then some very Cold War-like freezing of um, diplomatic relations in North Asia, which would be extremely concerning. 
Um, secondly, uh, cyber security, I think, continues to uh, sort of infiltrate its way into the um, um, strategic thinking of many countries. And, and really the problem there is whether or not uh, uh, some countries think that here is a more usable form of offensive capability which might be directed against their, their enemies. Um, thirdly, the nearer region. Um, I, I don't think we've seen an end to the pattern of um, the need for Australian intervention into our nearer region, which has really been established since Bougainville um, in the early, early 90s. We're almost with a pattern as regular as breathing, you can, you can find instances whereby there will be requirements for the ADF to, to uh, further deploy. But in circumstances where there will be fewer and fewer countries with an interest to want to come with us, and where the challenges become more and more co complicated because of the growth of um, populations and disaffection with regional governments. So I don't think the region has gone away, even though we've now withdrawn both from Timor and the, and the um, Solomon Islands. Um, we're just likely to find a new round, possibly involving other Pacific countries that will require Australia to lead a response in the fairly short term, let, let's say within the next two, two to five years. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid our time has now defeated us, but in a pre presentation where we've been introduced to the term of rivalrous interdependence, the five, or if you take Neil James's point, perhaps six Cs of the future, we've been introduced to new concepts such as strategy retrofitted budget profiling uh, and whether we're going to be looking at a glass half full or glass half empty uh, future defence white paper. Uh, our two presenters have taken on a wide remit of uh, a wide discussion, particularly in our, our discussion at the end of their presentations and we're even so bold to touch the third rail of prediction. Um, so on behalf of this hall, can we just join in thanking our two, uh, two presenters, Professor Wesley and Mr Jennings. <laughs>